Next week, we're going to kind of do a couple weeks because in all reality, we go, yeah, Thanksgiving's almost here. Woohoo! Christmas is almost here. Woohoo! We're with family. We're with friends. And maybe some of you during Thanksgiving and Christmas are going to be with foes. Reality of life. And we want to look at how Jesus can teach us to truly love all the people around us. So we're going to look at how to love like Jesus loved over the next couple weeks as we maybe are thrown into situations where we need His grace a whole bunch. We can learn from Him. So that's what we're going to do the next couple weeks. But today we're finishing up our series on altars. About, today is about worship and sacrifice. There's a, a survey that was done, asked some people, you know, when they heard the word altar, what did it mean to them? They, both, they came from different experiences, they had different answers. Some of the answers were, some thought of an altar as a place where salvation happened. Others thought of the altar as a place that was sacred. Others thought of it as a place where you would come and pray or there would be someone to pray with you. One person said, when they heard the word altar, it is the place you should run from if you don't like your fiancé. I don't know where you sit when it comes to the thought of altar, but I imagine all of us come with different traditions and thoughts on the altar. Maybe you've had your own unique experience of being in the presence of God. Maybe, as we've jumped into this series, this, this concept of being in His presence, in, in the altar of His presence, maybe that is new for you today. But the significance of the altar is this. It is a place where God encounters man and where man encounters God. You know the great thing about the altar? It might be as you're driving to work. It might be a place in your home. It might be out in the woods. It might be by, while you're walking. It is a place where we say, God, I need you. God, I'm going to be with you. God, be with me. It could be at any place at any time, that altar where the presence of God surrounds your life. The Hebrew word, when we talk about altar, it means a sacrificing place. So to come to that place of God's presence, to that altar, it was an understanding that it was a doorway. It was a way to access the presence of God. Because of sin, God could not dwell with His people. So in the Old Testament, maybe you remember the Old Testament, God instituted the tabernacle. It was the place where God would live. It was His home, you could say, on this earth. So when the people would move, the presence of God would be taken in the tabernacle and go with them. Now, the things inside the tabernacle were not just randomly set in place. The furnishings all told a story. There's a, a liturgy of how to enter into the presence of God. So in the Old Testament, as you would enter into that tabernacle, as you first walked in, there you'd come face to face with an altar to give a sacrifice for your sins. And then you would walk past that to the labor and you clean yourself of the dirt and the mess. And then after entering into the inner courts of the tabernacle, the lampstand would provide light to make your path clear. The table of showbread represented God's provision for all of our needs. And then right in the middle of the tabernacle, the altar of incense was a place of prayer and intercession. And in the holy of holies was the presence of God in the Old Testament tabernacle. The tabernacle was a journey of preparing us to be in the presence of God. What was the very first thing when you stepped into that tabernacle? It was an altar. You know, if we had designed the tabernacle and how we attempt to come into the presence of God, we might do a little bit different. We might put the, the table of showbread up front because, you know, when you go to a party, what's the first place you look for? The snack table. 
the place of provision. That's what that represented being in His presence. We come and pray and we seek God. And oftentimes we go to the provision side first. God, help me with this. Oh, 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 God, you know what's going on at work. Oh, oh, dear Lord, you know my family. God, you need help me with this. And you got, we got our list of, God, can you do these things for us? Provide for us. Or maybe, maybe the first thing that we would have in our tabernacle would be the lampstand. We seek revelation. We need direction. God, God, make my path clear. But the fact is, the very first thing moving towards the presence of God was an altar of sacrifice. You couldn't go around it. You couldn't bypass the altar of sacrifice. If you wanted to get into the presence of God, it started with sacrifice. You had to lay something down and confront the sin in your life. I'm praying for us today. Folks, Today was, is one of those days that I've been praying that God does something in us. That, that we push a little bit farther in our relationship with God. That we push ourselves to a little bit deeper understanding of who He is and His love for us and to truly know Him more and more. Folks, we need the presence of God every single day of our lives. Sometimes we have to push to get there. Our passage of Scripture in the book of Exodus, chapter 27, it's going to be on the screens. If you like to look in your Bible, you can. Exodus chapter 27. Starting in verse 1, it says this. You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horn on all all. On its four corners, its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. Okay, but be honest. First reading that, I felt like I was opening up an Ikea manual, trying to figure out what is what. But here's the reality of God's manual for these things in the tabernacle. Every detail mattered. Every detail can speak to us as we look at that Old Testament tabernacle. In verse 1, it said, make it out of what kind of wood? Acacia wood. It is known as one of the hardest, one of the strongest trees that you could find. It was known to be indestructible, that type of wood, that type of strength in that wood. If they had airplanes back in this day, you know what the black box would be made out of? Acacia wood. It was strong. You know what else about this wood? These trees only grew in the desert, in the most severe conditions. So maybe you are here today, and you're thinking about your severe condition. You're thinking about the troubles. You're thinking about the worries that life has thrown your way, and maybe you think you, that this qualifies you from being used in the kingdom of God. But the exact opposite is true. You know, God commanded that which grew in the worst conditions. Anybody here today with some conditions, some things in life that you just wish weren't there? Anybody except me? Yeah, I, I'm wishing that wouldn't be. Or maybe something in your past that you wish you'd done different and it haunts you and it bothers you. God commanded that those in the worst of conditions could be used the most strategically. That testing in the wilderness for that tree is what set up that piece of wood to be used for that sacrifice which would be burnt. Those conditions that you're facing, those circumstances that you are going through right now, they are just a tool in the hand of God. It's like a hammer. A hammer can be used to tear things apart, that's what I'm better at, tear things apart, mess things up, or it can build something beautiful. I'm going to just maybe tell someone today, stop cursing the pain that you are in and pursue the promise that God has for you. The circumstances may not be what you hoped they would be, 
The circumstances may be hard and difficult, but it is a tool in the hand of God that is going to produce strength in you if you will trust Him. And He wants to use you in that. Verse 2 said to cover the wood with bronze. Another form of protection to sustain the altar during that sacrifice with fire. So what would happen is man would come, sinful man, would come and try to be with a holy God. He would bring a blood sacrifice of an innocent creature in the Old Testament. This animal was laid upon the altar. And guess what? It was messy. It was bloody. There were guts hanging out. It wasn't a pretty picture. The altar actually is a messy place. When we think about the altar, we think of nice and clean and carpeted and vacuumed and comfortable. The altar is messy. The altar is difficult. The altar is hard. When we are in that pre- when we're in the presence of God and we are truly experiencing Him, there will be tears that will probably flow from us. There will be hurt that will probably be pulled out of us by the presence of God so He can heal us. The altar can be a messy, difficult place. But the altar is needed. You being in the presence of God is needed. Because none of us are righteous. No, not one. Only by the grace through Jesus Christ can our sins be taken care of? We need the messiness of the altar. The scripture goes on to say, there were four horns covering the four corners of the altar. The horns were actually used to help tie down, to help bind the sacrifice. It was a holding mechanism. But also another passage of scripture in 1 Kings 1.50 it also represents a place of desperation. It says this, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 50, Now Adonijah was afraid of Solomon, so he arose and went and took a hold of the horns of the altar. Can you picture him? And it was told Solomon, saying, Indeed, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon, for look, he has taken hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. This guy couldn't control his situations. He couldn't control the circumstances that he was in, but he went and he just hung on tight to the altar. He hung on and sought after God's grace and God's favor. He waited, he struggled at the altar. Have we lost the art of waiting on God? Because it's an art. It's not easy. It takes conviction. It takes passion. Have we maybe lost the art of wrestling with the Lord? Maybe you grew up hearing this word that I heard growing up, tarry. To tarry. It means to linger. It means to wait in the presence of God. It means to stay with the Lord and maybe wrestle and struggle and your knees might hurt and, and you're in internal dismay and struggle and you wait on God and you seek God and you worship God and you surrender to God and you sacrifice yourself to God until you sense His presence, until you sense the answer or the conviction that He is with you. My prayer is that we have the conviction within us that says, God... My place of altar, my place where I'm going to seek you. God, I'm going to stay. I'm not going to leave until I hear from you, until I know that you are with me, until I can sense your presence. Seeking is one part content, but two part resolve. To wait, to tarry, to to just be in his presence. My prayer is that all of us get to that place where we say, God, I resolve. God, it is deep within my soul not to leave this place, this moment, 
until I know you're with me. You know what happens in those moments? When you get to that place, the Holy Spirit does something incredible in your life. The Holy Spirit refreshes you, renews you. The Holy Spirit is so close. Maybe you're here today and you're wondering, I remember when God felt close to me to be in His presence. We have to first go through that altar of sacrifice and push past ourselves. Push past our ideas of God. Push past our own failures. Push past our questions and our doubts and to linger with God. I remember hearing a phrase, it's been a long time since I heard it. Maybe you've heard a grandparent or a great-grandparent say something like this, I can't, never did. Anybody hear anything like that? I've heard that before. I can't, never did. You know what it means? I got to keep going. I, I got to keep pushing forward. Even if I have nothing left, I'm going to keep on going until something happens. You know, with runners, it's called a second win. I'm not a runner, except if someone's chasing me. But I hear it's a second wind. Something in the body, the endorphins change what you think is pain actually into that actually feels good. It, it tricks you. It tricks you in the pleasure part of your brain saying, you know that pain in your legs as you're running and you want to quit? The body produces these endorphins that says, guess what? That actually feels pretty good. Let's keep on going. We get a second Wind, but it is only through the pain and the duress that your body clicks in the endorphins and say, no, that is not going to stop you. That pain is what is going to propel you forward. Do we even know what a second wind is in chasing after God? Or do we just give up when we get tired? Or we just throw in the towel when things don't go our way? We, we, we ache or we might hurt a little bit. God is challenging us, I believe today, to go after Him in His presence and to seek Him beyond our own ability and allow the Holy Spirit to push us into His presence. To wait. To linger. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength, they shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, verse 30 of that passage, it starts out and says, even youths grow tired. The translation of the youth is actually a Greek Olympic athlete. So it says, even when the youth, he's saying when the best of the best, the strongest of the strong, the most supreme athletes, even those people get tired. And even the youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but the best of the best, they have limited strength. But again, it said, verse 31, just look at it again. Those who wait, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar like, what does it say? They'll soar like what? Eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and will not fall. They will soar. They will soar. But I think most of us are not like the eagle. Most of us are more like the hummingbird. Have you seen the hummingbird? Got to go do this, got to go do that. Got to go backwards, go forwards. Oh, got to go pick up the kids, got to go do this, got to go get the roaches, got to work, go to work, got to go do this, got to do this, got to go over again. Oh, don't forget that. You're flying, you're flying, 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 flying. You got to keep going, keep, keep going. That's how most of us live our lives and our relationship with God. Have you ever seen an eagle go? No. An eagle soars. An eagle soars on the wind. Is there a struggle? If we wait on the Lord, maybe you're in a season of life where you just feel like you're going nonstop 
and you've lost the presence of God, and maybe you're trying to force it back into being, no, just wait. Just be in his presence. Just love on him. Just worship him. And hope, wait on the Lord. Allow him to carry you. Your praise makes a difference. The passage says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that we come and we worship together. And what happens is when we start to praise God and enter into His presence, we draw others with us. But the power that is in our public praise, it depends on our private prayer with God. If you want your praise to make an impact on those around you, it is dependent upon you being in the presence of God. You seeking after God. And I believe God has called us to step into His presence, to be with Him. But to enter in, there's probably some sacrifice that's going to have to happen. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, steps out and it says, Then He said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was fervently praying to his father. Scripture tells us that his sweat became like drops of blood. He sought God to the point where his resolve helped him understand that God may not give him his way, but his will. And he was ready to make a sacrifice. I don't believe we can bypass this place of sacrifice and expect to get into the presence of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says this, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of of Jesus. In the Old Testament, there was a sacrifice that had to be tied down onto that altar. The priest would come and kill that sacrifice, and he would lay his hands on the sacrifice, and there would be this symbolic transfer of, of the sins of man onto the animal. It was a release of the failures, it was a release of the mistakes, it was a release of the sins in that moment. I am thankful that no longer we have to do that. Jesus Christ became that sacrifice for us. But my question is, do we devalue Christ by half-heartedness of worship or half-heartedness of laying ourselves on the altar and surrendering ourselves to Christ? Or maybe just giving God the leftovers of our life. And maybe, maybe we try to earn our salvation through works. We devalue His sacrifice when we do those types of things. I believe we are compelled. Compelled to come to Jesus and almost, you could say like in the Old Testament, lay our hands upon Him and let Him take our sins upon Himself. The tabernacle. To enter into the presence of God first was an altar, a sacrifice. Today, I've done a shorter message because I believe we need to have an altar of sacrifice. For those who are leading worship, you please come. We're going to worship again in just a moment. 
Hebrews 13, 15 says this, Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. A sacrifice of praise. I don't feel like praising God. Pastor Brian, you know what life has been like. All I can say is, oh well. You're not the only one. God in His Scripture tells us to bring praise to Him even if it is a sacrifice of praise. Because when we praise, when we sacrifice, when we open ourselves and surrender who we are to God, it opens the doorway into the presence of Almighty God. And my goal today is not for us to have a better understanding of sacrifice or altars or to encourage you today per se. My goal really is to challenge us all to push a little bit, to go into the presence of God. Pastor Brian, I don't know if I've ever done that. Trust me, being in His presence is the most important thing. Pastor Brian, I'm uncomfortable. It's okay. Just worship Him. Be in the presence of God. Pastor Brian, I don't know what to say. Just tell him thank you. Just tell him how much you love him. Just tell him how much he means to you. Describe him in his greatness and his awe and his wonder. Maybe today we just need to tarry a little bit. Maybe today we just need to pause in the busyness of the hummingbird world and allow God to renew us and allow God to breathe some freshness into our soul. So we'll be like the eagle, just kind of soar in His presence. Would you stand with us today? We're going to sing a song of worship, and my challenge to us is just to focus upon God and worship Him. And in a moment, I'm going to invite you, if you want, to make a place of altar with God. It may be down here. It may be at your seat. You may kneel. You may stand. You may pray. You may be worshiping. I encourage us all, seek the presence of God and allow Him to do a work in us. Would you bow your heads? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that in this moment, God, you would confirm your word.